The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Tough economic times beget tough economic questions. Tonight, we'll tackle a big one with costs up and wages stagnant. Who does the economy really work for anyway? CNN economic analyst and author Rana Faruhar explains the global picture. Then we'll explore whether Canada's economy could do a better job of both being more productive and sharing the wealth. It's Tuesday, January 10th, and that's next on The Agenda. Globalization and free trade won the day for decades. National governments made deals and opened borders to goods and capital, though not without skeptics and in some cases massive protests. It led to remarkable growth, but also real problems such as growing inequality. Rana Faruhar is global business columnist and associate editor at the Financial Times and global economic analyst for CNN. Her new book diagnoses what happened and offers a sober analysis of what should come next. The book is called Homecoming, The Path to Prosperity in a Post-Global World. And Rana Faruhar joins us now from Midtown Manhattan in New York City. And it's great to have you on our program. How are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Let's start with a bit of a checklist here as I set up this first question. Canada, like America, has had stagnant wages for about a half a century. We've got runaway home prices certainly here uh, since 2015 anyway. We got high inflation, particularly when it comes to food and fuel and rent. Unemployment levels are pretty low, which is good. But the governor of the Bank of Canada has told Canadian business leaders don't raise wages because he's worried that could exacerbate inflationary pressures. And of course, most young people today can't save nearly enough money to buy a home. So question, who exactly is the current economy working for? Uh, well, you know, it's working basically for the top 10 percent of the population that owns about 85 percent uh, of all the stock. Um, you know, asset prices have been going up, as you pointed out. And that's because we've had four decades of what I would call a kind of a fake growth, a financialized growth, a saccharine kind of growth that was basically about interest rates being kept low, um, globalization, outsourcing jobs to the cheapest places, um, wages being flat. And people, for a while, feeling like they had more money in their pockets because the price of consumer goods was going down. But, you know, cheap flat screen televisions never made up for the fact that all the things that make us middle class, as you mentioned, housing, um, uh, in my country, health care, uh, education, everywhere, these things have been rising at triple the core inflation rate even before this latest bout of inflation over the last couple of years. So, really, the economy works for the, the, the minuscule amount of the population that owns most of the assets. Um, but as you point out, it's not working for everyone else. And in particular, it's not working for people that make their money from a paycheck. We were assured by both Democrat and Republican presidents, and frankly, in this country, too, by both liberal and conservative prime ministers, that this would all be good for us. Why did it turn out not to be the case? Well, it, it's a great question. Um, you know, what we're talking about, this problem of rising prices, stagnant wages, a sense that um, the economy simply doesn't work not only for the working class, but for the middle classes, this has been part of what I would refer to as neoliberal globalization over the last half century. That's really been the economic underpinning um, on which policy decisions, not just in the U.S. and Canada, but in many developed countries, and indeed many developing countries, have been made. Um, this idea of neoliberal globalization was predicated on the fact that if consumer prices were falling, if share prices were going up, then everything else was okay. It didn't matter whether you outsourced your industrial base. It didn't matter whether you um, uh, let banks become too big to fail. You know, all of the problems that we've seen, it didn't matter if you had supply chains that may be highly efficient, uh, meaning typically meaning that they're monopolized by a handful of companies um, and, and go to where labor is cheapest, but aren't particularly resilient. That didn't matter. But as we have discovered in in the last, um, you know, I would argue 10 to 15 years, really, since the great financial crisis and its aftermath, but very particularly since the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, we've discovered that the world is not flat, right? Um, it does matter 
where you live. Place matters. And the global economy has become so disconnected from national politics that it's really caused, I think, a political crisis on both sides of the aisle in North America and in many other countries. Is it fair to say that had COVID-19 not completely sort of destroyed much of the world's economy and supply chains and so on, that the advice and analysis you provide in your book might not quite be so spot on? Uh, no, I wouldn't argue that at all. In, in fact, the changes that I'm talking about actually began began uh, to take shape not only before the war in Ukraine or COVID, but even in some cases before the great financial crisis. Um, so let's take a step back. If you look at this conventional globalization, the world is flat. The system that we're talking about that allowed us to put capital, goods, labor, where it was most convenient and productive for companies, not necessarily for individuals, but for companies to do so, that did indeed create a great amount of global wealth. In fact, more global wealth than really ever before in, in, in economic history, at least rec recent recorded history. Um, but it also did something else. It created a tremendous amount of inequality. In-country inequality rose in almost every country. And that's why you began to see the more fractious politics that you did on both the left and the right, because you had large swaths of the population living, in some cases, in entire communities that were wiped out. You know, I grew up in the rural Midwest in Indiana, in the U.S. Um, I saw through the 80s and the 90s and the, the early part of the 2000s the result of trade policies that literally wiped out entire factory towns, entire farming communities um, within a few years. And then you start getting deaths of despair, opioid addiction, all those problems that are really about place-based economics. And what's so amazing is that the policymakers that made these decisions thought place didn't matter. They really thought that it was fine to create jobs anywhere at a global level as long as some were being created and that it didn't matter where you were in the world. The world was flat. But as we've discovered, that is, that's not the case at all. Um, and I try to tell this uh, story through real human beings and, and, and real communities and companies in the book. I'm going to read an excerpt from your book and then we'll dive in and pull some questions out of that. Sheldon, if you would, let's bring up the graphic here with this excerpt from Homecoming. A large and growing body of research has shown that productivity, that is, the value each worker creates within the economy, tends to decline in markets with rapidly expanding financial sectors. The industries most likely to suffer are those that require a very long-term outlook, like advanced manufacturing. Wall Street wants profits today, not in 10 years or even five. And yet most of the new technologies that require investment today won't pay off for a decade. Financialization encourages public companies in particular to use their ability to raise money in the capital markets, not to invest in research and development or worker salaries, but in cutting costs, which has, over the last four decades, resulted in offshoring to cheap labor countries and engaging in share buybacks, the process by which companies buy back their own shares in order to limit the amount of shares on the market, thus artificially raising their price. Okay, lots to get through here, Rana. Let's, um, mm -hmm. let's start with productivity. Canadian workers lag behind American workers, we're constantly told, when measuring productivity. And the question often comes when we have economists on this program, for example, how do we get Canadian workers to be more productive? My question for you is, is that the right question to ask? Uh, in a word, no. It's interesting because just um, a few days ago, the International Labor Organization actually came out with a study. I did a column on it, in fact, in the Financial Times, looking at um, nominal wage growth and the connection to productivity um, versus real wage growth and the connection to productivity. And the upshot is that in North America and indeed in most G20 countries, there has been a disconnection between growing worker productivity and what workers actually get paid in this, it basically is in the turn of the century. So, so since 1999, workers, as they have gotten more productive, no matter how much that's been, have not been seeing 
the wage growth from that. So that's really, really unique. You know, if you go back to the 80s or even to the early 90s, if workers did become, in fact, more productive, they would get higher wages. But that's not happening now. That link is broken. And you know, it's difficult to, to create uh, tight causalities when, when issues are so complicated. But there is a lot of correlation, a lot of research to show that financialization, this process of essentially investing in share buybacks, which are, it's a kind of a, 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 a parlor game in a way of, of pushing a share price up. A company takes their excess cash that might go into, say, um, worker training or putting a new factory somewhere or coming up with a, a long-term project that could really change things in an economy. And instead, they use it to buy back their own shares on the open market, which actually artificially inflates the price. Doesn't change what anybody's doing in the real world, but it changes things in the markets. That has been growing since the 80s and in particular since the 90s when there were a lot of tax policies, particularly in the U.S., that really encouraged debt, encouraged, encouraged these kind of financial shell games. And so over that time, you began to see, not just in the U.S., but in many developed countries, share buybacks and financial um, sort of tricks going up, 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 and the actual amount of research and development money going into Main Street going down. So essentially, not only is the link between productivity and wages broken, but the link between a good stock and a good company is broken. And that gets to this bigger point, this felt experience that, frankly, I think many of us have, that Wall Street is up here doing whatever it's doing, and we're all sort of down here, um, you know, trying to figure out why are asset prices still relatively high, even after a correction, when I haven't gotten a, a raise in, in real terms, you know, if I'm an average North American uh, since the early 1990s. If I'm a working person in many places, I haven't gotten one since the 70s. So um, something is deeply broken here, and it's that we're incentivizing the wrong things. Well, okay, play that out for us I I to its logical conclusion then, and tell us why it's a problem and where we end up if we incentivize yeah. the share buybacks as opposed to reinvesting in research and development or people. Sure. Um, well, you end up in a place where global companies are doing very, very well, and the people that run them, which is, that's a handful of people, are doing very, very well, and everybody else not so much. Um, there's a, a piece of research in my book, actually, that looks at who the major beneficiaries in terms of the share of the overall wealth pie have been in the last 40 years. This is UN research. Um, it's actually multinational companies, many of them in North America, and the Chinese state, because that was the bargain. U.S. companies, multinational companies in developed countries sent capital and sent jobs to cheap labor regions of the world, China being the largest among them. Um, and jobs were created there at very cheap wages. Um, companies got rich. Uh, they spent a lot of money buying back their own shares and paying the C-suite more money. But those middle-income jobs, particularly in the, manuf and in the manufacturing sector, in the industrial sector, um, didn't grow. And, you know, as somebody that grew up, I, you know, I was in factories all the time. My father was an engineer. He ran factories in the Midwest that were in the Detroit supply chain. You need manufacturing to iterate and to innovate. You know, that's how Taiwan uh, actually captured 92 percent of the, the world's semiconductor um, industry. They started making them, and then they got better and better and better and worked up the food chain. We had an idea, particularly in the U.S., that everybody in the country could somehow be a software engineer or a banker or a burger flipper, and that that was going to be okay. But in rich countries, most of the economy is about consumer spending. So you asked me to play this out to the natural um, end point. Well, if you have a 70 percent consumer spending economy and people haven't gotten a raise in real terms since the early 1990s, at some point the math stops working and the politics stop working, and that's where we are now. Okay, but I remember the story in your book, and I can't remember the labor leader's name, but he was in conversation with somebody who said, don't you yes. worry, free trade is ultimately going to be good for all workers three or four generations from now <laughs> after jobs have spread out all over the world and then workers in other less developed countries see their wages and living standards raised and then by then everybody's going to be better off. Now is that still the deal mm. we're making and how does it look today? 
Well, it, it's a great point. You're referring to an interview that I did a few years ago with the late labor leader Richard Trumpka, who um, he passed away a couple of years ago. He was the head of the AFL-CIO in America, the uh, largest labor union. And um, yeah, it was an incredible story. And you know, this is actually worth thinking about deeply because he told me that a policymaker from the Clinton administration had come to him and said, "Look, we know that globalization, neoliberal globalization, is going to kill." labor, not just uh, in the U.S., but in other countries where wages are relatively high. Um, and uh, he said, well, yeah, it is. Well, you know, how long is it going to take to get back to normal? And this policymaker said three to five generations. And this is how economists think. They plug human beings into an algorithm and, and come up with three to five generations. Well, guess what happened during that time? You got the hollowing out of the Rust Belt. Um, you got the rise of Donald Trump. You also, on the other side of the coin, you got the rise of Bernie Sanders. You get more extreme politics. You get decoupling uh, and deglobalization, not only for good reasons, which I'll get to in a moment, but for negative reasons, which is more fractious politics, trade wars, et cetera. So a lot can happen happen in three to five generations. Now, to answer your question about, is this the paradigm now, it's interesting because, as I said earlier, even before uh, the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, you were actually seeing certain kinds of jobs that had been outsourced to Asia begin to come back and the economy, the global economy, to become a bit more regionalized. That was happening in areas like the textile industry, the furniture industry, um, you know, shoes, things that were cheap. And we suddenly realized, gosh, does it really make sense to tote these cheap, heavy products um, thousands of miles through geopolitically contentious areas like the South China Seas, emitting tons of carbon, spending a lot on energy, which, of course, is no longer cheap? And a lot of CEOs were beginning to say no. And they were beginning to say that actually making things locally for local markets makes more sense. And indeed, um, there are a lot of reasons that, that this is continuing continuing to happen now, not just strategic reasons. We're seeing, um, you know, the U.S., North America, Europe all start to um, get their own industrial strategies around things like semiconductors for strategic reasons. But you're also seeing a lot of industries start to reshore because um, it doesn't make sense to expend this much carbon in supply chains. And there are now technologies like, for example, additive manufacturing, 3D printing that allows you to literally make in hours the parts for an, a car or, or even a home. One of the stories in my, my book um, takes place in Austin, Texas, where there is an entrepreneur that is using a, a, a sort of a NASA-sized 3D printing machine to lay down a house, a 1,500-square-foot house, $250,000 in six days. Um, so what we can do, what we can make locally has changed tremendously because of technology. So how should Canadians regard this new sort of post-global world that you're describing? You know, I actually think that Canada is in a really great place in a lot of ways in this world. Um, it may not seem like it if, you know, you think just about the stats you just laid out. But I think about deglobalization not so much as a zero to 60 kind of change, but more about regionalization. And so what you want to be part of is a region that has food, fuel, and consumer demand. And that's North and South America together. I mean, it's even North America um, on its own. You could probably get there. But if you look at Canada, the U.S., Mexico, other Latin American countries, you do have that. You've got food, fuel, and consumer demand and a block that can actually connect more deeply in a healthier way and really lift all boats around trade and manufacturing and services. You know, I would love to see, for example, a much deeper industrial strategy between Canada and the U.S. around things like uh, the green transition. If you look at some of the intellectual property that is living in small, smaller, mid-sized Canadian companies and U.S. companies in the EV space, and then you look at the manufacturing uh, capacity that still exists in many parts of the U.S., but also in, in Mexico and Latin America, you could get to a pretty robust industry pretty quickly, but it requires connecting those dots. And I think that that's where we're going to now. Well, here's the big overarching question, and that is uh, democracy, of course, is the uh, worst form of government ever tried, except for everything else that may have been tried from time to time, as everybody well knows. Yeah. But democracy demands uh, elections, you know, fairly frequently. You have them in, for your national situation every couple of years. Uh, we tend to have them every four years here. Corporations want profits 
not even four years down the road. They want them now. They want them by the next quarter. Mm. How do you build a new system that takes into account the need for long-range thinking when economically and politically we are so focused on the here and now? You know, that is the... $16 trillion question, if I look at the size of the U.S. economy. Um, you know, there's not a silver bullet answer to that, but let me let me give you two or three things that I think are happening um, that are creating tailwinds for this process. Um, for starters, we've seen the end of easy money. We are now um, at a point in the markets where as interest rates rise, as debt bubbles begin to pop, as you begin to see things like the collapse of the UK economy, the collapse of the crypto uh, currency company FTX recently and the bringing down of the, that whole risky sector, you're beginning, as, as Warren Buffett always says, to see as the tide pulls out who's been swimming without their shorts on. Um, so we are going to get some pain in the markets. And typically when you get challenges like that, that's actually when you get reform. And this time around, it's not going to be like an 08 because the central bankers don't have the firepower to come in and just paper over the problems. So that's one tailwind. The other thing is you, you have a deep uh, conversation going on in many parts of the world about do we want shareholder capitalism or do we want stakeholder capitalism? Do we want something that enriches communities as a whole? And um, as part of that, business leaders, regulators, um, uh, consumers are all starting to think about how do I buy things? Is cheap really cheap? You know, um, if I were to purchase this sweater um, from uh, cotton made in Xinjiang that was perhaps done in a forced labor camp and it's cheaper, well, is that really cheap? Who pays the price for that? And so slowly but surely, we're beginning to see new rules coming down the pike around things like carbon emissions, for example. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act, which was, um, you know, the clever, cleverly named climate bill that was passed by the Biden administration, is really about starting to track supply chains and see what's the price of cheap, what's the carbon price of cheap, what's the labor price of cheap. And these kinds of regulations are happening in many countries. And I suspect that over the next few years, maybe in a decade, maybe in two decades, you're going to get to a point where you're going to have a kind of a nutritional label that is on products and even on companies that is going to give the consumer a much sharper view of what they are actually buying and what the real cost of that product is. And then the final thing that I would say is that we in North America and, we, you know, in rich countries in general, we often think that we're sort of pulling all the strings. China is a major driver of this new world. Um, even before the Trump administration, if you go way back to 2015, China put out um, a, a, a report called the Made in China 2025 plan, and it was basically saying, look, we have enough consumers in our own country and region that we want to now produce for ourselves. We want to own our own supply chains. We want to be more regionalized. So we are decoupling. We want to be free of Western technology within the next few years. That's happening no matter what the U.S. or Canada or Europe does. And that's going to be a powerful force um, in this new, more regional world. Well, as you've said, the world is not flat, and neither was that conversation. That was really fascinating. <laughs> I want to thank Rana Furuhar for joining us on TVO tonight. The book is called Homecoming, The Path to Prosperity in a Post-Global World. We're grateful for your time. Thank you so much for having me. If it feels like it's never been harder to make ends meet, or for that matter, to get ahead, it may be cold comfort to hear that plenty of people feel the same way. Across many economic sectors in Canada, wage increases remain stagnant or below the level of inflation, while interest rates and prices keep rising. The bottom line, the economy matters to everyone, but does it work for everyone? And if not, why not? Let's get into that, starting in Naples, Florida, with Vass Bednar, Executive Director at McMaster University's Master of Public Policy in Digital Society program. On Manhattan Island in New York City, Brett House, economist and professor at the Columbia Business School and a fellow with Canada's Public Policy Forum. And back here in our studio, Graham Moffat, co-founder and scientist with System 2 Neurotechnology and a senior fellow at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Sunil Johal, Vice President, Public Policy with the CSA Group and a Professor of Public Policy and Society at U of T. 
And Kaylee Thiessen, economist and policy analyst at Unifor, Canada's largest private sector union and, full disclosure, the union that represents some of the employees here at TVO, including the ones who are hopefully keeping you all in focus right now. Thank you, everybody. Uh, let us start with this. I'm going to read something that was in the Globe and Mail over the weekend, and that will kickstart our discussion. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development recently projected that Canada's economy will be the worst performing advanced economy over 2020 to 2030 and the three decades after. And the really bad news? There's nothing in the current federal budget or associated economic development strategies designed to reverse this trend. Unless we build the expertise inside our policy community to deal with the structural economic issues surfaced by the rise of the intangible economy, middle-class Canadians will continue to experience a financial squeeze and our public infrastructure will continue its own path of erosion. That is not what you call a hopeful outlook, but Vass, I want you to react to the suggestion that we are the worst performing advanced economy over 2020 to 2030 and three decades after. How should we regard that? I mean, it's it feels like harsh language, but Canada's productivity challenges aren't uh, a secret. In the past, they've sort of been masked by uh, growth in the natural resources sector. We know that we tend to underinvest in research and development, and we know that our companies do a poor job of adopting, uh, adopting rather, new technologies. So I'm kind of glad we're getting this kick in the pants, especially as we see a global recalibration of our broader approach economically. Brett, could I get you to react to that as well? Well, I'd build on what Vass said and add that what we've seen over a few decades is that private sector investment has been very weak in Canada. And that is what has driven that poorly performing productivity or research and development performance. And what we need to do is figure out what mix of policies and economic conditions are really going to incentivize private businesses to invest in capital, technology, equipment and processes here to allow workers to be more productive. Graham, are you similarly as down on the future as the Globe and Mail appears to be? Well, I'd like to think I'm not, um, that we have an opportunity to turn this around. Uh, but I think there are some important uh, real uh, moral imperatives to, to get growth back on track. If we want to have greater prosperity in the future, if we want our kids and grandkids to have better lives than us, if we want to be able to deliver health care uh, to Canadians and all of the services and public infrastructure that they want, then we really have to get growth back on track because um, getting stuck in a low growth equilibrium for a long time causes people to get stuck in sort of a zero sum mentality uh, where if for, some, for one group to win, another group might have to lose. And that gets into all kinds of ugly politics and discrimination that is a real risk to Canada in the future. Kaylee, how do you see it? So I was like both surprised and not surprised by this data. We have seen that government is making some really important investments. So we're thinking about childcare, for example, and how that will improve the experience uh, and the well-being of people who are operating in our economy. Thinking about all of the auto investments and the industrial policy that we keep hearing about and, and talking about um, will actually do quite a bit to improve our performance. I don't think that was necessarily taken into account in the um, in the research that was referenced there by the OECD, um, and that government is talking about all of the additional industrial policies that we need to put in place as well. So I have, as well, a lot of hope that we can turn this around. Um, but there are things that um, cause me to be sort of unsurprised. You know, instead of looking at something like uh, improving wages and working conditions during uh, the labor tightness we saw last year, we saw government just sort of open up uh, the temporary foreign worker program, which dampens working conditions and, and wages, um, which means then people aren't reaping those benefits. So it's kind of a not a zero sum game. If I can borrow Vass's line, did you think we needed that kick in the pants from the OECD? I don't think so. I think we've known uh, that we're a bit of the, the frog in the boiling water and, and the temperature's getting hotter and hotter. I mean, we know what uh, globalization has wrought on the Canadian economy. We know we have an aging population. We're going to have fewer people in the workforce. Uh, going forward, technological change is moving ever, ever more rapidly. Uh, 
we need to start thinking like a 21st century country. And much of our uh, thinking to date has been rooted in our, uh, in our history. So in the 19th, early 20th century, we're a small geographically dispersed country. We're very close to the United States. Let's kind of focus, stick to our knitting. You think we still uh, think of ourselves as hewers of wood and drawers of water? I think in a lot we, of ways really? we do. And we, we want to protect our industries that are uh, have kind of been with us. We want to make sure we're delivering services across the country. And we're a little bit afraid of that opening up to competition, opening up to the world. Uh, but in a, digital, in a digital environment, you have to do that. I mean, we can't kind of stay uh, within our borders now. We have to look globally. We have to look more. Uh, expansively. So I'm hoping that uh, that's the conversation we have as a country going forward. Kaylee, let me try this with you. The If you look at the unemployment numbers, you know, they're not bad, relatively speaking, if you look at the last 40, 50 years. We're, we're in a pretty good place right now. Do you think that gives Canadians a false sense of how strong the economy is and that they don't realize we're actually in more trouble, at, you know, per this report? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think that uh, we've seen the labor force shrink a little bit uh, compared to the rest of the economy. And we saw so many uh, retirements or accelerated number of retirements during the pandemic. So the unemployment rate has something to do with that as well. Um, and what we thought or what I thought we would see during that period of labor tightness is employers start to invest in technology that could work alongside workers to enhance productivity. That would also uh, mean that we would need to raise wages for workers who are working and developing, working alongside that technology, developing that te happened. technology. We didn't see that happen. Instead, we saw um, policies that would just put downward pressure on wages and working conditions, trying to sort of generate some sort of job creation. Uh, and also then um, the Bank of Canada coming in and raising the interest rate so quickly to try and dampen economic growth instead of actually taking um, the, the energy that was in the economy right now and sort of boosting us forward. Graham, can I get you on that? Do you think Canadians don't quite understand that our fundamentals really aren't as good as we'd like to think they are? Yeah, I think one of the things that people are coming to, to terms with now is that um, what was a demographic tailwind for maybe most of Canada's history, if not all of it, is now turning into a headwind. So, uh, you know, for, for most of our history, we've had a growing population, we've had a, a growing employment ratio, a certain amount of number of workers relative to the total population. Um, and now that's shifting fundamentally in a way that uh, the, 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 the dropping uh, unemployment rate, the low unemployment rate, is actually masking some big problems here. Um, mainly that you know we're our employment ratio is dropping and our productivity per worker is not increasing so the number of hours worked is no longer increasing and also the productivity per hour worked is not increasing which means that we're going to run into some big problems um, in terms of delivering services and actually having really productive economic activity and prosperity so Neil so everything Graham said is correct but I don't think the average Canadian thinks in terms of productivity and unemployment rates they're looking at my housing costs are going up my food costs are skyrocketing I make the same or less than my parents did 30 or 40 years ago doing the same kind of job. And I might be working two jobs or uh, in a precarious uh, kind of ca casual form of employment to make ends meet childcare costs. Maybe they're going to come down a little bit going forward. But I think the average person is looking at all of the cost uh, factors that are, are hitting them really hard in their pocketbook. Uh, they might have a job, but how secure is that job? So I, I think for the average person, uh, they don't feel confident. And you can look at those top line numbers like unemployment and uh, productivity and GDP growth, but those don't translate to the person who's living uh, as a single mom in uh, Toronto or uh, with a couple kids in, in Northern Ontario, and they're wondering, what's the future hold for me? And are things going to be better for my child than they are for me? Because we're starting to run into questions about whether or not that's the case going forward. In which case, let's say all of what we have discussed so far is sort of the prelim for the big question that we want to put on the table right now. And Brett, I'll get you to start on this one. And that is, who is the economy working for? Tackle that if you would. The economy is principally working for asset owners right now. We've seen since the 2008 financial crisis, the value of almost any good, um, whether it's real estate, art, uh, equities, or stock investments, go up substantially in an era where we are awash in capital. And uh, by contrast, we haven't seen wages keep up with those asset uh, value increases. So really, the economy is working right now for people who own things. Um, it's not to say, though, that Ottawa hasn't tried very substantially 
to try to address this. We saw under a series of budgets, under former Finance Minister Morneau, cuts in corporate taxes, increases in subsidies to business uh, for research and development. We saw an acceleration in depreciation for tax deduction or tax deductions for capital spending. Uh, we are now the only G7 country with free trade agreements with every other G7 country and with every continent in the world. And so we have really gone to the policy toolbox to try to do all the things that business say, says that it needs in order to invest in improving the situation and the effectiveness of workers. But we haven't seen business come back with uh, the capital spending that that was supposed to incent. So the big question to me now is what more do we need to do? And I think that's a question for business as much as it is for policymakers. We, we will uh, pursue that question in a moment here. And incidentally, I'm sure Mr. Morneau thanks you. That what you just said is probably the only nice thing that's been said about him ever since his book came out. So <laughs> let's get that on the record. Uh, Vass, you want to follow up on that? Who's the economy working for right now? Yeah, circle gets the square. I mean, I think the economy works really well for shareholders. I think it works very well for people who own intellectual property rights as we see digital technologies scale and grow. And I think uh, for people who own property. So we're seeing a, a rental crisis on the tail of our housing crisis. I think we have a generation that sort of uh, anticipates and understands the inequities here. And in instances where we do see modest, and the emphasis is on modest, productivity growth in Canada, we don't see the share of that productivity actually get returned to workers. Kaylee touched on this, right? We see those returns go back to shareholders. So in reconciling with our poor productivity history, I think Canada is also looking ahead and starting to think about what does, you know, what does this history of, of shareholder capitalism mean? Where is it getting us and where is it going? Well, the word productivity has come up numerous times so far. So, Kaylee, I'm going to get you to follow up on that. My hunch is when employees hear the word productivity, what they think is, you want me to do more for the same money. And is that part of the reason, maybe there's a suspicion on behalf of workers as to what productivity is all about, is that one of the reasons we are such laggards at productivity in this country? I don't think we can put the blame on workers for this. First of all, people are working incredibly hard across the economy in every sector. Um, and we are seeing that we're doing more, working harder for the same amount of, for, um, for the same amount of money or potentially even less, because we've seen wages stagnate over time, um, and with less people. So we're kind of accomplishing the same amount for, with less resources or the, um, yeah, with fewer resources. What we'd like to be seeing is business invest using um, technological change, working with workers to create the technology that they will then use to do their job better, then also making sure that the rewards from that technological change, that productivity enhancing activity, uh, is delivered to workers and not just shareholders and owners. Graham, who do you want to blame for the fact that Canada is constantly seen as being laggards when it comes to productivity? Boy, that's a tough one. I mean, some people like to, business likes to blame the government. The government likes to blame business. Um, everybody's looking for somebody else's a scapegoat on productivity. So it's, it's a real challenge. Um, and I don't know that there's a, there's a simple answer to this one. Um, the question we really need to, to, to ask is, what do we do to un unblock this productivity stagnation? What do we do to fix this? And unfortunately, um, you know, we're facing some unbelievably significant headwinds. So there's the demographic headwind, which we mentioned earlier. Um, another big uh, barrier to productivity is, so our most productive places, most productive places in any economy are, are large cities. Um, and uh, workers are more productive when they can live um, near other workers and near lots of jobs. Uh, these are uh, the kinds of things that you, reasons you'd want people to be able to live in the largest cities in a country or in a province. Um, and what we've seen is the cost of housing rise so fast that this is actually a big significant drain on productivity. Not just because workers can't live near the best jobs and you know, interact with other workers and get those kinds of productivity gains and creative interactions uh, that drive capitalism and drive economic growth, but also because um, this enormous amount of growth in the, in the housing sector as an asset class has drawn capital away from productive investment in, say, manufacturing tooling or investment in capital uh, expenditures in, in private enterprise. Let me get another voice uh, entering the conversation here, and that is earlier in the program, we had Rana Faruhar on, uh, author of a book called The um, Homecoming, The Path to Prosperity in a Post-Global World, uh, CNN financial affairs analyst. 
And uh, we talked to her about productivity, and let's hear what she had to say, a little bit of what she had to say, then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. There has been a disconnection between growing worker productivity and what workers actually get paid in this, it basically is in the turn of the century. So, so since 1999, workers, as they have gotten more productive, no matter how much that's been, have not been seeing the wage growth from that. So that's really, really unique. You know, if you go back to the 80s or even to the early 90s, if workers did become, in fact, more productive, they would get higher wages. But that's not happening now. That link is broken. Do you agree with her that link is broken and therefore that's part of why we're in the soup right now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've seen that decoupling of wage growth from productivity. The economy is growing at 3, 4, 5 percent, but worker wages are rolling up 2 or 3 uh, percent. But I mean, this is only a part of the p puzzle, right? I mean, we're talking about economic growth, we're talking about GDP, we're talking about productivity. Uh, but these measures don't account for things like social value, they don't account for environmental costs, they don't help us think about long-term issues. And for too long, we've been kind of focused on short-termism. How do we turn profits over? How do we increase GDP and juice it for the next year, mm. the next quarter? Uh, but if we're not thinking about these things in a more sustainable, comprehensive manner, we're, we're doomed to kind of repeat the same mistakes that we've faced in which uh, case, in uh, the past. Let me get Brett in here. We talked about unblocking productivity. If we want to look to the long term mm. to get our numbers going in the right direction, throw some ideas our way. What should we do? Well, I think it's important to underscore that workers have done their part. Canada is one of the most educated labor forces in the world with some of the highest completion rates on tertiary education. So individual Canadians have invested in their own productivity by increasing their skills in education and training. I think what we need to do now is figure out with business what we can do to unlock those big cash stores that they've built up during the pandemic and over the last decade or so to deploy them for for productive manufacturing, research and development ends here in Canada that will employ people in higher productivity and higher wage jobs. That seems to me the real roadblock that we've got or bottleneck that we need to resolve. And if we look at the April 2022 budget, Mr. Freeland devoted four chapters to growth and productivity. She admitted that it most, makes most people's eyes glaze over, and I guess the thing is, we're gonna have to keep all of our eyes cleared and focused on this, even if it seems a little boring, because our lives really do depend on it economically. Vass, what would you add to that in terms of our ability to unlock productivity gains in our economy? I think a lot about how we're treading that line between an efficient economy and an exploitative economy. So in addition to the care economy investments that Kaylee mentioned, which I think we will start to see hopefully more you know, returns to, and we see those deeper connections to productivity goals that in the past were a little bit more siloed, uh, even aspects like bringing a consumer protection lens to what it means to exist in the digital economy can help us maybe find areas where there are blockages or dampening um, from a competitiveness standpoint, but also from just a citizen or consumer's ability to interact kind of properly in the marketplace. Well, let me put a tweet to you, Vass, and um, this was kind of clever. It's a PhD student who put this out on Twitter the other day, got a lot of likes and a lot of retweets, and it speaks to the sort of smallish nature of uh, our economy. Mm -hmm. Canada is just five big banks, two grocery chains, and three telecom giants in a puffer down jacket. <laughs> that was the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> do, do we have uh, an oligo... I'm going to have trouble with this. Oligolopical? Do we have an oligolopical uh, economy here? An oligopoly that owns too, too much of our economy and therefore that's part of the problem? I mean, Canada has a serious consolidation problem, and some of that goes back to what Sunil was pointing to earlier, right? We made uh, national policy decisions to favor global competitiveness over competitiveness within our country. And we've started to overlook that link between uh, productivity and competitiveness. Um, more competitiveness, you know, spurs, it disciplines the marketplace, right? It incentivizes firms to be more creative, to be more innovative. Less productive firms may exit. Um, it also in incentivizes 
causes those investments in research and development that we've been lamenting kind of aren't there in Canada. We have the evidence for it because firms need to compete more vigorously and be more innovative. So now that Canada is kind of uh, having its competition moment, trench coat and all, I think that's very complementary to ongoing conversations about productivity. I got to get the guy who used to be an economist for a big five bank to comment on this as well. Okay, Brett, you used to be with Scotiabank. Uh, when you guys sit around the uh, cafeteria, do you talk about the fact that uh, t too much concentration, too many monopolies, too much oligopoly in this country, and is that part of the problem? Well, you know, there's a dual-edged sword to that uh, to that debate because on the one hand, uh, we lament the fact that we don't have big national champions in Canada that are big brands and forces in major markets around the world. And yet at the same time, I'd agree with Vass that we do need to ensure that if we develop those national champions, that they are provided with the right incentives and the kind of marketplace here in Canada that will push them to be competitive, to invest, to increase productivity, research and growth. And getting that balance right is a constant tension. Uh, it's never something that's complete. Uh, it has to be worked on continually. And you know, at the moment, I think that tweet really does capture what the stock market looks like in Canada. If you look at the TSX, it is a very small collection of industries and companies, and that is not necessarily a recipe for really competitive enterprise here at home. Kaylee, what's your take on that tweet? Oh man, I think that there's so much going on in the economy aside from what's happening in those big five banks. Are those big five banks important to our economy? Of course they are. There's so much else that's happening. Um, whether we're looking at grocery stores and grocery chains are growing um, uh, substantially and, and we're seeing all sorts of concentration happen in grocery chains right now. I think we need to start talking about how uh, we dampen corporate power and actually increase countervailing power. So we have a competition moment Moment right now where we're going to start hopefully revamping the Competition Act and how can we use the Competition Act to increase uh, the countervailing power that sort of pushes back against corporate power so we can continue to develop the policies that we've seen government, at least at the federal level, try to implement so that the economy actually works for people. You want to dampen corporate power right now? I don't know about right now while I'm sitting here, but maybe we can think about it going forward. I mean, I, I think Kaylee's right. I mean, this is, it's not just a conversation about competition policy. I mean, this is, there's labor law, there's collective bargaining issues. I mean, unionization's in a constant state of decline in the private sector. Uh, in Canada, it's investments in social infrastructure that free up women to enter the labor force. Uh, it's a whole range of issues. And I mean, I think the challenge is the economy is a big, complex, messy beast. And thinking about it through one lens or two lenses is not sufficient. We need to take a really broad base perspective that looks at what federal levers we've got, provincial levers, what's the private sector bringing to the table, what are higher education institutions uh, bringing to the table. If we only look at it through a competition lens, we're going to, it's, it's a short-sighted approach. Yeah, I get, sure. Can I jump in on that? Please, you yeah. know, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, sort of back in 2020, June 2020, we were talking a lot about how do we build an inclusive economy? Mm -hmm. And what does it look mm -hmm. like going forward to have something that's even stronger than what we had before the pandemic? What seems to have happened is is that we're starting to talk about how do we get back to the status quo. And I find that really disappointing. I think that there's so much that we could do to actually build something better than what existed we before. We were going to build back better, right? Yeah, exactly. What happened to that? Exa mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. We started, we had some investments in 2021, and then all of a sudden in 2022, again, thinking about the federal budget, there was uh, so much... Um, dampening of, of the excitement. Like, don't worry, we have inflation. We're just going to get back to the status quo so that we don't uh, mess anything else up, when in fact we could have had transformational change. How do you see that, Graham? I, I think that's right. I think, I think um, you know, the, the assessment that we, we've sort of lost the momentum for transformational change has, is, is correct. Um, you know, if we, if we look at um, the, the distribution of firms in Canada, as Brett and Vass pointed out, uh, there's not just a lot of old firms that are sort of low innovation in low innovation sectors. Um, there's also a real missing middle in Canada that we don't have medium sized businesses. We tend to have small businesses and very large businesses. And the really high innovation, high growth businesses, you know, 500 employees are sort of missing in the Canadian economy. We have to have a serious conversation about how we get small businesses and startups to be able to grow um, into scales that where they can they can really drive productivity growth and innovation in the economy. Do you know, Graham? why it is that way? I don't know if anyone knows why it's that way. I mean, I think this is, you know, this is one of the great economic mysteries of Canada. Why is it that we are... We're, 
it, to a certain extent, Canada is very lucky. We live in a safe place. We've been, um, we've been able to coast on population growth and a wealth of natural resources for a long time. We've, all, we've had abundant energy. Um, and now that the world's changing and those, uh, that population growth is turning into a demographic headwind, we're really stuck. So um, we're going to have to be very creative to figure out a way out of this problem. Uh, part of that will be, um, as Vass and, and Brett have suggested, maybe taking away some of the enormous pricing power of these Canadian behemoths and the, the oligopoly economy, um, maybe forcing them into, uh, into stronger competition, killing some sacred economic cows even. Um, I don't know if there's political will to do that, but we're going to run up against a wall where we're going to be forced to make that choice very soon. Brett, how does that sound to you? Yeah, you know, Steve, I think there's some reasons why we are dominated by some very large companies, and that's because traditionally we have been in the resource sector, which is very capital intensive, and we're continuing to move into a world where ideas and intellectual property play a bigger role. And that middle-sized part of the economy and business sector that Graham was pointing to is going to become increasingly important. On the upside, you know, there are a lot of policy ideas that are percolating through the federal finance department right now that could help address that. Uh, the 2021 and 2022 budgets looked at creating employee ownership trusts that would allow the huge wave of baby boomers who are looking to exit and retire from their businesses to sell them to their employees. And we've seen in the US and UK that that's been a major factor in growing that middle part of the economy and ensuring that we not only have shareholder capitalism, but stakeholder capitalism, where workers themselves are benefiting from growth. We also know that the move to get uh, childcare arrangements in place across the provinces is already ensuring that we have the highest proportion of women in the labor force that we've ever had in Canada's history and looking across the target uh, core working age population, we have the highest share of Canadians working that we've ever had. Uh, so we are doing some things right and if we complemented that with greater competition, freer trade between the provinces, the IMF and the OECD have both said we could add you know, on the range of about four percentage points to GDP almost overnight at the stroke of a few policy pens. So we've got things that we can do. Okay, let's get some more ideas. Vass, what would you add to that list? Well, I want to go back to Kaylee's optimistic vibe that she was bringing at the start of the show, because I think something we haven't forgotten that was a big conversation early on in the pandemic was uh, resiliency, the resiliency of our economy and starting to look at supply chains. And there was this kind of nudge towards a little bit more nationalism, a little bit more self-sufficiency. And that creates some interesting new opportunities for some of Canada's other historic strengths, such as, you know, manufacturing and additive industries, uh, as well well as as we look to create uh, competitive strengths, uh, you know, as we look to green the economy and with green technology. So again, I wrap this all up, that, that kind of harsh uh, prediction for us in terms of our, our future productivity in this moment, not just where we're rethinking competition, but where we're, you know, rethinking what it means to build back better and what our economy means in this global context and what it means for a social, robust social safety net, as Graham was saying, and, and what it means for technological investments and, and adoption as well. It is, I'm optimistic about the moment and ideas kind of concurrently coming to the table and we're going to need, I'll, I'll, I'll get sporty, a full court press. Okay, let's do the follow-up. Which sport are you quoting there, Vast Bednar? Full court press, basketball, five <laughs> five. <laughs> Good for you. Just checking, because you know a lot of people drop <laughs> sports metaphors on this program, and they really don't know what the heck they're talking about. But you, you, you got a ten I, out of ten there. Not, I not. I, you would say I knocked it out of the park. I would yeah. say that indeed. Yes. Okay. Well, we're on such a roll here. Okay, so you'll keep going. More ideas to unlock productivity, so, keep things going. I'm, I'm going to throw a very simple one, but I think a critical one out there. What gets measured gets done. Mm. I think we really need to broaden our metrics around what constitutes economic performance, not just GDP, not just productivity. How do we look at things like income inequality, poverty rates, female labor force participation, participation of disabled individuals, indigenous peoples in the economy. Uh, if we don't do that, we're going to continue 
butting our heads into the same wall where, okay, GDP growth is great, we're juicing GDP growth, but that's not getting us to a sustainable long-term vision for the economy. So if I were to just pick one thing that I wanted people to do is let's, let's get our heads around what does an economic scorecard for the 21st century in Canada look like? What are those 8, 10, 12 indicators we want to measure? And let's get everybody talking about and rallying behind uh, those indicators. And I think that will generate new ideas um, and new momentum behind uh, each of those metrics. Kaylee, what are you adding to the list? Well, I think that's a great idea, first of all. And um, what I was going to talk about here is thinking about redistribution. So it's one thing to talk about increasing productivity, growing the economy. These are very important things. But if we're not talking about how the value of that production is re is distributed to people who are participating in the economy, then we're going to continue to have people like we talked about at the beginning of the show who feel like they can't get ahead. So how are we going to distribute that money? And we're talking Does about that mean things taxes? like it could be, mm -hmm. it could be. We're talking about things like uh, industrial policy. We're seeing that again. I'll mention the EV str strategy, uh, looking at an industrial policy for the aerospace sector. You know, the forestry sector has so much potential. Um, uh, in it, and we need to make sure that we're working in a way that protects the environment, protects uh, the species that live in our forests, and also that we're harvesting uh, where where we can. So those those are some ideas. Also, we need to make sure that we impl improve employment standards. Sunil mentioned all of the ways that people are uh, really frustrated in the labor market right now. Their job, their wages aren't increasing at the lower end. We've seen some increases in the last year, but wages aren't increasing. They're working harder. Uh, with fewer resources, how do we improve uh, wages and working conditions for people? And then also thinking about some other government policies, like making sure the EI system that was sort of fixed during the pandemic and then we let break again, let's fix that. So if we do have a recession coming out of this period of inflation, people are supported instead of falling even further behind. Last 30 seconds to you, Graham. You know, I think we have an opportunity here to, um, to have a really important <coughs> discussion about what the future of Canada looks like and, and how, we, how we unlock growth and how we ensure that there's a greater prosperity in the future. My concern is that um, our, historically in Canada, we have this conversation and then we forget it. And we, we talk about you know, how we're going to get our, our economy into a different gear. Um, and then the, the future ends up being fine, but it could be great. Um, if we have the right conversations and we get the right policies in place, and uh, you know, I, I hope that um, I hope we, we we get unstuck and we really start moving things along on the, the productivity and the economic growth discussion because it's a moral imperative for us. So let's go for great, as you five just did. Mr. Director, can I have a shot of everybody, please, so I can thank all five of our guests for appearing on TVO tonight. It's been great to have your contributions. Many thanks. Thanks. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, January 10th, 2023. As Russia's assault on Ukraine continues, tomorrow we'll search for pathways to peace and what Western powers should do to help bring about such a result. I'm Steve Pagan. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.